Ecclesiastes says, food is good for the stomach, wine makes life merry, and money is the answer for everything. It's a good verse. Uh, sets us up for our time together. And today, money's a big issue, especially among younger evangelicals, uh, especially those who grew up in larger suburban churches where there was affluence and maybe a bit of guilt about a certain lavishness of lifestyle. Uh, it was interesting as well when the uh, current recession hit, I think it was Atlantic Monthly had a cover story asking, quote, did prosperity theology cause the recession? Uh, today then, when it comes to finances, it seems like there are two polarizing opposite camps that we will caricature and explore. Uh, one will be uh, prosperity theology, uh, that it, you love Jesus, you'll have rims on your rims and everything will go well for you. Uh, and then there's poverty theology that if you really love the gospel, you're going to sleep in a tent and uh, send all your money to uh, third world nations where people are suffering and hurting. And so uh, we'll let you go first, David Platt, Pastor David Platt, Dr. David Platt. You are in the process of getting typecast as the poverty theology evangelical guilt financial guy. Congratulations. Um, where, what is your, where would you start to explain your theology of wealth, finances, possessions, and money? Um, on, a, on a big picture, I would say that any approach to money has got to be looking at the word, looking at the world through the lens of the word. So, um, one of the most convicting parts of getting into some of this journey that I've been on the last few years uh, has been taking a good look at the world up close and personal and just... Okay, but yeah. how did you get to do that? What did your dad do for a living? Okay, just, I'll get, we'll get there. Okay, okay, no, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, we'll okay, there. okay. We'll um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll get there. So, so there are, there are massive needs around the world for the gospel to go, just like we were talking about earlier, and and, and people who don't, who don't have this or, or other basic daily necessities. Then we look in the Word, and there's 2,300 plus verses uh, that deal with money. And, and a whole theology of money, and as the gospel relates to money, like I walked through with our church, uh, 18 different conclusions. We walked through a, in a five-hour study, um, all the major significant passages, Old Testament and New Testament alike, and came to 18 conclusions about how the character of God informs how we look at money, how the sinfulness of man informs how we look at money, the sufficiency of Christ, the necessity of faith, and the urgency of eternity. These five core elements of the gospel, how do they affect the way we look at money? And I think what we see on a whole, if I were to summarize it, character of God, God is the owner, steward of all things, and as, as followers of Christ, uh, we, don't, we don't have a right to determine the direction of our money. Every dollar that we spend, he is, he is Lord over. Lord over every penny in our bank account. And therefore, if he calls any one of us to sell everything we have and give it to the poor, which he doesn't call everyone to do, but he does call some people to do. So, which means any one of us in this room could be among those. And so he's, he's Lord. And so his Lordship, that, that sets the stage. He's not just one financial counselor. He is, he is the one who determines everything about how we spend our money. And so, so we need to be seeking him as, and we're stewards of everything he's given to us. Uh, sinfulness of man, uh, wealth and money are not uh, inherently uh, evil. They're morally neutral, but they are extremely dangerous in the hands of sinful men and women. Money is extremely dangerous. Money uh, is dangerous and damning. Uh, I mean, when, when Paul says that the desire for riches leads to destruction, the ruin of one's soul, like that should cause 
all of us in, in the most well, one of the most wealthy parts of the world to, to rise up. Because that's just the devi- desire for riches. We've got them. Um, and then and Jesus says it's impossible. Uh, or well, He goes on to say, first he says it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Then he goes on to talk about the heart of the gospel and the fact that it's impossible. So anyway, sinfulness of man, asceticism is wrong and materialism is wrong. Uh, not just wrong, but materialism is, is dumb. So um, because we're storing up treasures that are going to waste away. Um, so that's sinfulness of man, sufficiency of Christ. The reality is Christ um, has called us to a, to a radical abandonment. To, uh, and that looks different in everybody's life. And that, that's, I'm not saying that's normative, uh, how that looks, but we see people selling possessions and, and fields and, I mean, letting go of major things in order to support the advancement of the kingdom. So some of us may need to abandon everything we have. All of us need to use everything we have for the advancement of the kingdom. Um, necessity of faith, how does that play out? When we trust in Christ, that, that transforms our possessions. When Christ transforms us spiritually, he transforms us materially. And so we start to give differently, we start to see differently, we start to sacrifice. Uh, so that doesn't mean we don't, there, there's a picture of where we do savor some possessions. I mean, First Timothy 6, same passage where he talks about uh, the ruin of the soul with the desire for riches. He also talks about God gives us good things. But then right after that, he says, give. And that's the antidote to materialism is give, give, give. Give sacrificially, um, generously, uh, cheerfully, all the things we see in Second Corinthians 8 and 9. And faith in Christ compels that kind of giving because urgency of eternity. We, we're, here for, we're here for a little bit. Like we've got a, a vapor here and there are uh, billions upon billions upon billions of years ahead of us. We need to invest in what's going to last for billions upon billions of years, not, not what's going to be in the most pr- pleasure right now. I do live and pastor in a context where, uh, that is marked by uh, major self-indulgence that leads to immorality and idolatry and ignoring the needs of the spiritually and physically poor. And so um, I, I think we, we've got to, to wrestle with these things. So that's okay. what, uh, my overview. Um, and you're rock solid biblically. We always appreciate that. Let me ask you a couple clarifying questions. What did your dad do for a living? He was an auditor with the government. He's an auditor with the government. Yeah. Wow. Not IRS, but <laughs> not IRS, yeah. but yeah, a guy who can count. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. Um, <laughs> and uh, who paid for how many? How many degrees do you have? Undergrad, grad, uh, postgrad. Five. You have five degrees. Who paid for all that? Uh, a variety of different means, such as. Uh, well, some scholarships, some uh, rental help, some work, some loans. Yeah, sure. The Get variety of different means. Found it. Okay. And, and I, I think I see where you're going, but let, let me, in this side, I think it'll help clarify. Like, I've not told anybody, and, and I wouldn't encourage anybody, okay, you need to quit your job and just, just go, unless the Lord tells you to and pack your bags and sell. To make sure yeah, 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 absolutely. In the context of Acts 13, it's the church commissioning out. Like, I don't, and I don't even tell people not to make money. I tell people to make a lot of money. Like, I encourage our folks to use the gifts God's given them and make as much money as they can. But in their making money, not to think that this is just, their, that, that, that because their salary increases, that means standard of living has to follow suit. Their standard of giving needs to rise dramatically. Okay. That we need to, 1 Timothy chapter 6, this is my practical ex- exhortation to a lot of people by, that I pastor. Um, it's, it's godliness with contentment is great gain. And what Paul defines there as contentment is food and covering. I mean, that's a real contentment level. But I think the picture is, there is a picture that God, and I think it's in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 too, God gives enough for us, but he gives excess for others, not for us Generous. to get more and more and more and more and more. Okay, and, and uh, I'm going to hand it over so to I'm, Pastor James. I'm good James. with people having jobs and supporting uh, education. Well, that's good, because yeah. I think the, the one thing, and I don't think you do this, but we've all got people who follow us and they only watch the five minute soundbite on YouTube and then they end up in a place that's not healthy. Um, your dad worked hard. Sounds like he had a stable job. Not only gave you roof over your head, food in your stomach, potentially some wisdom about money and some help to get you started. Mm-hmm. And what can happen with younger leaders, especially those who are single, you know, don't have kids yet or just real foolish and simplistic, they're not thinking Proverbs, a wise man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. They're not thinking unto a thousand generations. They're just thinking either materialistically, I'm going to blow it or I'm going to give it all away. And they're not thinking about what am I going to also give to my kids? And so for you, just threading the needle on that to the ends of the earth for a thousand generations, Mm -hmm. you put those together and I think you mitigate against, you know, Hey kids, we're flat broke for Jesus and good luck getting started. Um, 
you know, but love them, you know. Sure. Um, <clears throat> Pastor James, lock loaded, ready to go? <clears throat> well, I have a lot, of, uh, a lot of thoughts on this subject. Um, I don't uh, certainly disagree with uh, Christ's lordship over everything. I don't disagree with, um, you know, uh, using your resources to affect the kingdom. There's obviously biblical mandate for that, storing up treasure in heaven. As we were kidding at lunch, that's an irrefutable point. I think the issue becomes uh, not just you, but other people like Francis Chan, like John Piper, like Randy Alcorn, that are writing more and more and more and more about a poverty. You can say that it is an asceticism, but the fact of the matter is, is a lot of people are attaching a spiritual value to poverty. And it's not some guy who's been working for 30 years who's divesting himself of everything at a responsible period in his life. It's kids in their 20s sitting in apartments playing video games all day, reading John Piper and calling poverty spiritual. All right. They have, they're not making anything. They're not building anything. They're not doing anything. They're reveling in their poverty. And as we were talking last night, but they're not impoverished. Well, yeah, at, on they one got, level, they got yeah, correct. Food and so they have a wrong definition. No, they their have their a wrong. Parents, their water. parents are footing the bill. Their parents are footing no. the bill, and they're they're empowered to be satisfied with little ambition by a distortion of the message that you just. I think what you said there was great was great but that's really not the way in fact that it's playing out now I would agree with you the message against materialism is still the predominant message that needs to be heard and God's using you to sound that call I, I, I think that's fantastic but I just want to say to you that uh, you and a lot of others who are writing about radical disposition of resources I have a couple of uh, checks in my spirit about that and about how it's playing out you gave a very short reference to but I appreciated you mentioning first Timothy chapter 6 which says that God has given us all things richly to enjoy I think we are desperately in need of a more fully orbed theology of joy in the church today all right we're on like joy joy in God in God in God in God amen everybody for joy in God that's the contribution of John Piper's life he's an awesome man of God I'm so thankful for the uh, message that he's given but I've said this to John personally and now I'll say it publicly we need to extend as the book of Psalms does our theology about joy in God down into a theology of joy in the things that God's made and a lot of the poverty theology is causing people to feel guilty about possessions I have a car I have a house how much is too much where's the line I shouldn't have anything you must have said it five times not everyone's called to abandon all I'm not sure that anyone's called to abandon all or I'm not sure that anyone is called to do that and I think that the psalms are filled with rejoicing in what God has made what God has made guilt free rejoicing in what God has made it's Psalm 62 says I just wish there was a verse in the Bible that would tell me what to do with my increase here's one Psalm 62 says if riches increase do not set your heart upon them do not set your heart upon them it's not wrong to have it's wrong when things have you it's not wrong to have it's wrong when things have you, all right? The, it, the scripture is very, very clear about that. But what's slowly developing here with Randy Alcorn and his whole story of the godly stand that he took and how he is, light, he is locked out of income for his life because of a legal decision. And so he's developed a theology that allows him to kind of come to grips with having nothing. And the problem comes when everyone else sees that as normative and starts proclaiming that as a source of spirituality and as a source of sanctification. I just don't see that being a biblical view of possessions, all right? It's not wrong to have, it's wrong when things have you. And certainly you said it, generosity is what breaks bondage to uh, materialism, materialism, not poverty. Sure. Uh, at the same time, uh, so I, I appreciate all that. At the same time, uh, I think we too easily dismiss some of these texts that like the rich young man, for example, your rich young ruler. Well, that was his problem. His heart was too much in his things. Well, Let's not dismiss ourselves too much from that. I don't think we realize how much our heart is in the our rich things. rich young ruler thing was a guy who but wanted to follow Jesus, but he was attached to stuff. And right. Jesus said, go sell everything you have. Not because that was, oh, great, I'll sell everything I have. The point was Jesus knew he wouldn't do that because things had his heart. And I think we don't realize how much things have our hearts. I think when Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, he is saying, your heart follows your money. All right. Not just your money follows your heart. Your heart follows your money. Where your money is, there your heart will be also. And so when we pour all our money into 
bigger, better, nicer things. Our hearts are going there. Yeah. When we pour Agreed. our resources into reaching unreached peoples with the gospel, our hearts will follow there. It's a, it's a, and, and not that it's all mechanical. I mean, the heart's on both sides of it, but. Yeah, but again, it seems I like some of these discussions come down to this. What I'm objecting to is a kind of spirituality, and I see it uh, with pastors. I see it now with pulpit committees. A lot of pastors aren't, uh, how, how many pastors could say, I have more money than I could righteously spend? Not many. Most pastors are living under boards who have read books like the books we're talking about and are using that to punish and beat down pastors who can barely make ends meet and they can hardly have enough money for a pizza on Friday night and their kids grow up hating God because they were forced into an impoverished, can't make ends meet living in the name of spirituality. And what I'm trying to say is poverty is not spiritual. Okay, God is not lacking for resources and poverty is not spiritual. You can enjoy the things that God has given you without becoming attached to them. You can send more and more and more overseas and rejoice in a God of abundance who has given us all things richly to enjoy. You can do both of those things and not have false guilt and not feel all bad that I got an extra full length sub at, at Jimmy John's instead of the half one because I could have sent that money overseas. And somebody told me, I, I got to know this now. Somebody told me that you said or wrote, and I don't know this, so just tell me because it might not have even happened. Someone said that you said, we don't serve the kids in our church Cheez-Its in the children's ministry because we want to send that money to missions. Tell me you never said that. Okay, no, it's something similar. So oh we my went, gosh, that's no, so follow sick. Me, follow. <laughs> but it, listen, we, we went through. Your poor kids. No, that's the say, thing. Say what you the said. Way we're They're using lose their citizenship just so they can go get Cheez-Its. The way, yeah, I know. The, the way I, 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 I've got to throw this in and I'll go back please to Please do, I, please I, do. The way we're using poor and poverty, I think is really irresponsible okay. because we're not poor here for the most part. I, and I know there's people struggling all throughout my community. Yeah, but you got to distinguish. I'll fight you on this. See, I grew up behind a strip club down the street, Green River Killer, Ted Bundy, you know. And it's I, affected you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 In a good way. In a good way. In a good way. In a wonderful way. My great-great-grandmother starved to death in Ireland during the famine. That's how my great-great-grandfather emigrated to this country. I'm here instead of County Cork, Southern Ireland because mm. of starvation. Mm. So I understand destitute poverty, I mean, from my own family history, mm. but there's also working class poor. And that was my daddy, a union drywaller till he snapped his back hanging sheetrock to feed five kids. And so for me, when we talk poor, yeah, there is destitute poor, I get that. People in my family starved to death. Working class poor as well. You can look at those guys, so you got a roof over your head, food in your stomach. I could tell you, being the son of a drywaller who snapped his back, that, you know, times are tight, mm -hmm. things are hard, even for those who are working, especially in an age when if you want mom to stay home and you want to have a lot of kids and you want dad to be the sole provider, but he doesn't have, you know, five degrees um, and it's not a sin that you do. Um, it's amazing that he does, but it's, 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 yeah, it's, 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 you can't just, I mean, yeah, poor and poverty, we need to use carefully, mm -hmm. but I would just carefully say, don't overlook working class poor. Don't overlook the hardworking Hispanic furthermore, guy who's feeding his family. Don't feel sad for the guy living in sub-Sahara Africa or in the jungles of Indonesia that I've been to, who's living in a hut as though I should cut something off of my house or go to one car so that I can get more to him. He, I, look, I've eaten dinner with people living in hovels that you wouldn't put your garden instruments in and I don't feel sorry for those people okay this whole idea it's it's like it's like the people who have have a materialism problem and the people who don't don't it's like saying that the guy who's who's uh you know filling his face with four hamburgers and weighs 350 pounds he has a food problem but the guy sitting in the corner of the cafeteria weighing his turkey and he weighs 114 pounds and he's eating 97 calories a day he, he has a problem too it isn't that more equals a problem and less doesn't equal a problem. And, and these people that I've eaten overseas with who, who have nothing by North American standards, but they've got more joy than we could ever lay our hands on, we want to send our money to them. We're going to ruin them. They don't need more money, all right? We have a problem. We have too much. I agree with that. But saying, well, push it over there and make it all equal, we're going to screw them up. I just, I think, I think we see money as the answer to so many things. Like if we could just get more of our money over to some other people or, I just don't get that. Come back here. Well, at the same time. I'm supposed to go to bullpen. Okay. 
or we get an eight-cornered cage and just settle this. Uh, <laughs> Pastor Matt? Well, here, here's, what's, here's what's getting lost here. I mean, we're not even talking about the issue. Like what David's saying, and I'm, I'm speaking for David and John. Good. Uh, David and, and John, in, at the end of the day, uh, aren't saying, let's take our money and give it to the guy in the hut so we can get friggin' direct TV. Right. Uh, <laughs> he, he, he's saying, he, what's being said is to, to set the line. And then, man, we've, t- we've come back to this like 14 times today already. There are disciples of disciples who have disciples who have taken sound bites and taken it to places it shouldn't go. Right. But, but at the end of the day, Platt and Piper are saying... That there are, I mean, you can, you can see it fires up in David so quickly and so easy. There are thousands of people groups who've never heard the gospel. So is it then okay for me to have a six inch sub, which is a legit sub and, 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 and push the gospel to the nation? So it's not, let's build a pool for Omar in, in sub-Sahara uh, Africa. Right. It, it's what's our responsibility financially to All get right. the gospel to All people right. who don't have it. All right, but so then, I, and I, I agree, and we give so much to missions, we gotta be careful we don't continue to character ourselves here. But all, all I want to say in that regard is, is even as it relates to, I don't know how many of you all have traveled, but I have been all over the world. I was on a mission board for 10 years. I preached in every corner of the world to, on almost every mission field. Honestly, what we send to missions sometimes is such a pathetic, colossal waste. Even the whole model of missions and the idea that money for missions, missions is so broken, it's just flat out broken. Okay, the way that missions goes on, how effective it is. There's been enough money given to missionaries every decade for the last hundred years to get the gospel to every corner of the earth. So why the heck do we have to keep hearing about a thousand people groups that have never heard the gospel? Someone is screwing that up, okay? Because we have sent enough money for that to get settled about a hundred times over, okay? Why isn't that settled yet? Something is broken with that. So let's send more overseas, but it comes back to the stewardship thing again, okay? How we steward our resources. So rather than sending money to divest myself of guilt and to prove to myself that I don't have a materialism problem, I'm responsible for how that money goes out and how it's stewarded. And after 10 years on a traditional sending mission board program, we went to just Church Planting International where we choose the nationals, we plant the churches ourselves because I just couldn't live anymore with the wastage that goes on in missions. You don't think missions is kind of broken? I think we need to do it right, but, and, and certainly there, there's a lot of things that are broken, but uh, it's, it's worth making major sacrifice. I agree with that. In order to make it right and support it right all over the world. I mean, that, that's, that's, and that's the thing. And that, that's what, or come back to the, uh, it wasn't cheese it it was goldfish. Uh, for okay. our kids. Um, but we, I want to hear that. We walked, Help me to really understand what you through, said. Okay, we, we were studying James. We came out on budget season. We looked at our budget and we said, do we really believe like what we're saying we believe? The, the, our budget does not reflect the picture we're seeing in James. And so we just said, all right, let's take a year. And for this year, let's cut everywhere we possibly can and free up as much as we can for gospel partnerships we have in uh, inner city Birmingham and in, we focused on India. 41% of the world's poor in one country, 600 million people in northern India, less than 1% evangelical Christians. So, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna free up as much as possible. And so our staff went through and during budget time, our worship staff cut 83% of their budget, which shows we had a little fluff to deal with anyway. So cut 83% there and all the way down to the preschool ladies saying, we don't have to have this whole assortment of snacks for our kids. Like we can, we can do without some of these things that we're providing every well, week. I, I respect that process. And, and so, and it was a great process. It was a very sanctifying process. I, I would like not, yeah. I would not say. I think it's sucktastic. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's what I'm saying. I think that the it's wrestling, good. no, it's not. Okay. I think, <laughs> I think, I think that, see, here's the thing. You, you pastor a church, okay? I think that your passion, honestly, I just think your passion for the world and the bell that you're ringing in that regard and the statistics that are your fingership, I got to say, I'm closer to you than what the people are that are watching. I can see almost the tears in your eyes. Like the tenderness in your heart for lost people everywhere is exemplary for us. And I'm impacted by that. But I have to say, you pastor a church and I struggle with the notion of, of, and I've seen this, I don't want to mention any pastor's names or pastors that we've even mentioned here previously, but I'm just going to say, I've seen what it looks like for kids to grow up in poverty theology homes. Okay. Now, pa- unpack that personally. Tell me. What's your backstory? What'd your dad do? 
Well, are I think, you ta- are you talking about pastor's kids? Yeah, yeah, I am. A pastor's kids and kids in your church. I mean, I grew up, my dad was a, a teacher in a school. We were adequately provided for, not well off in any respect, but adequately provided for. And I'm very thankful for my parents and the uh, gospel that they, you know, entrusted to me. But I, I'm just saying that I, I just really fear the um, stingy, cheap, like I know some of these churches where this poverty theology has been going on for years. The wives have to work outside the home because the church doesn't pay the pastors enough. And, and the impact that that makes on the families in the church and the kids grow up and they can hardly make ends. Like that's like pulling your kids back in a slingshot and train them, shoot them, train them to hate God is what you're doing. And I would never, I mean, it's pathetic that you guys cut the Cheez-Its from the kids. It's just, it's just ridiculous. Like God is not lacking. Freaking those people in your church had enough money to do everything you did for missions and buy snacks for the kids. The fact that it came down to snacks for the kids or world missions, it, talk about a false dichotomy. Talk about putting your people in a position where they gotta make a choice they shouldn't have to make. You should be able to bless your kids and, and give them crayons and everything they need in ministry. You should be able to, you should be able to have phenomenal worship ministry with state-of-the-art equipment and everything and do all this stuff for missions mm. there's enough money for that yeah. what you did was you took what they gave and you cut the piece to get more for missions you cheaped it on the church side for a year and your people kept the residual all right but but to see the process of children saying hey it's good for us to give up some things in order to give over here Tr- that's, in, in, that's, no, that's that's valuable i that's disagree with that valuable. Because see, it's like this. I, I got an, I, I do consulting at churches and usually it doesn't go well, but there was one situation. <laughs> it just doesn't. They, their attitude was, you know, in an effort to give to missions, in an effort to give to the poor, we're not, we're not gonna really pay our pastor. So I'll give you one case scenario. I didn't, I didn't, okay. So, so the situation there was, you know, we're not going to give to the pastor so that we could give to the missions. And I said, well, why wouldn't you not give to the pastor? Pastor is the mission. Pastor, and, and the deal is, if you give to the pastor, what's he going to do? Well, what's the pastor going to do? The pastor is going to be generous with the money. He's going to give it. So my, my, I would take that even principle. And my thing is like, if you can't trust a leader with the money, don't take the money, fire the leader. Right. Okay, we, we, didn't, we didn't cut salaries, and it was the leaders who made these decisions. Right, but they didn't make a decision to cut their salaries. But we, they, we didn't cut their salaries. But you should That's have. That's what I'm saying. Give the kids the Cheez-Its. You screwed the kids on the Cheez-Its. <laughs> You're saying we should have cut people's salaries? I'm saying if somebody really wants to make a sacrifice, they make a sacrifice. They get what they earn, and then they give generously. Exactly. And if That's what, what we did. And if they and if they voted, I mean, I don't know what their giving is, but generosity is not just I voted for the right politician or the right church uh, budget. I gave sacrificially, generously, cheerfully, regularly. Right. I'm so going to just say a step deeper, though. Like, why would you not let the kids get you took? I mean, the, you took crackers from my kids. I'd be doing prison ministry from the inside. <laughs> no, 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 no. Like, that was the beauty. They wanted to do this. That was the beauty. I, Not I, all of them. <laughs> go ahead. Go to a deeper level. Hang on. Hang on. I want to I hear what he's going to say next. I want to hear it. Practically, this does play out. Like, we... We are spending our resources, even in the church, okay, on... And this is in the church that I pastor on so much stuff that is not necessary for the advancement of the gospel that could be used okay. in far better ways. But you inherited He's a building make- that's fully paid for with a number of affluent people. Yeah. Uh, most pastors are not in your circumstance where they don't walk in with five degrees in a fully paid for building and a bunch of rich people who don't care about people. But that's unusual. But it's but that's the beauty hearing different stories from other churches who are, are in totally different. Yeah, I'm not, saying, I'm be not careful that- what you would give your people trying to make that normative for all churches because it can backfire in a lot of places where the building's not paid for, the people are not affluent, and, and it's not the same cultural context. And, 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 and I think that we feel like, we, we've talked about this quite a bit, I think we feel like there's a lot of, um, it's, the, it's the cheap mentality. You know, Jesus wrote, what was it, uh, 38 parables he spoke about money. Six, 38 parables he told, 16 were about money. Uh, none of them were about giving, really. 
I mean a little bit of that. Mainly it was about stewarding, stewarding, stewarding. So if you, if you, get, if you have $100,000, so here's a, here's a great example. I think people should stop writing about money who don't understand money, okay? So the, the whole king, prophet, priest thing, I'm not sure of what you, you would say your exact gifts are. But the people who are writing about money are not first. kings, man. They do not know how. If you, if you have $100,000 of excess resource in your church, <laughs> all right, you can send that overseas and feel good about it. And, and, and it'll help something, I hope, a great need that I said you're passionate about. Thank God for that. But you can also take the $100,000 that you have and invest it in something that multiplies. Okay, you can make it into a million dollars and then send it overseas. And this idea of as soon as the money comes in, divest yourself of it. And I see ministry, I've talked to John Piper about this in great length. You're supposed to multiply it. You're supposed to multiply it. You're supposed to multiply it. That's in every parable. Multiply it, yo. Sending it overseas is burying it in a napkin. But if we're sit- no, 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 not if we're sending it overseas, right? Well, you can multiply you it here. You can add a zero. You can yeah. add three zeros to it. Send it next year. You You're supposed add, to multiply it. You can add six zeros, but at the same time, you can also multiply it by using that money, $100,000 say it was, to infiltrate a whole people group with the gospel. Th- that people group, uh, and, and I'm, I'm not saying what the strategy would be, but then that people group can then multiply the gospel in a region that's never had before instead of it just sitting back you over just, here growing yeah. zeros. All you're d- like there's multiplication that can happen here, like eternal multiplication yeah, well, that can obviously. happen here. So send the 100000 now and put it into one people group and let it go like that or like that. Okay, let it go like that. Or... Um, send half of it now, keep half of it, multiply that, and send it to two more places. I'm just saying the idea of into my hands, out of my hands, as quick as possible, because I'm so afraid that I have a money problem. I gotta get out of my hands as soon as I can, because money's evil and it's gonna drag me down. Get it away from you, get it away from you. That is a very unhealthy way. It's making, uh, it's making money the root of all evil instead of the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of it. Now I hear what you say. What you said was so good, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. So give some of it, a lot of it, a painful amount of it away quickly so that you can break bondage to loving money. It's dangerous. We agree. But we're also supposed to multiply it. So I'm calling out for that. And we're supposed to enjoy some of it. And I want to come back to, I want to hear you speak to how half of the Psalms, half of the Psalm content is about delighting in the works of God, not in the person of God. Joy in what God has given to us. Uh, 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 a night away with my wife, a, a bouquet of flowers purchased for her, a, a special dinner together. I don't want everyone to feel guilty about that or like I should have sent half my sub overseas. There is, <laughs> there, there is a theology of joy that is not fully developed yet and, and, and it's in the works of God as an expression of joy in the person of God. Who's writing about that? So good. Well, there, there is certainly, I mean, first of all. I want a thumb say, on that one, yo. <laughs> We're There's, supposed to go to questions at some point. Okay, questions right. now. Okay. Sorry, dude. No, you say, you say. I don't want to cut you off. You no, let's go, we'll go to questions. No, go ahead. You're the nice, humble one. We have to let you say something before we're done. <laughs> Here the questions, man. I resent that. <laughs> no, you resemble that. <laughs> go, Dave. Uh, Oh, I forget. What, what, what were we? We're just talking about so joy in the works of oh, yes, God, not the person. Absolutely, absolutely. You agree um, with that? What do you think about that? Sure. God has given us good things for enjoyment. First Timothy six, and yes, it's all over the Old Testament and New Testament for for that matter as well. Uh, Would you agree that that's a, ne- a neglected area of a theology of joy? Um, I, I think we live in a culture where we have sought our joy in more and more and more things. And that's, and that's, question. and that's really, really, it's dangerous and damning. Right. And so the reason I'm passionate about this is yes, for needs around the world, but for the souls yeah, of the I wanna, people that I want to cut you there the because I think that we're trying to, we're reasoning, come let us reason together. We're reasoning together. And I think that it, it, the first thing that you said about how it is dangerous, it is damning, and we have found too much of our joy in money, I would say agree. And now as the pendulum is swinging this way, and many excellent people are writing about give it away, give it away, I'm just calling out and saying this, all right, that there is a real danger in um, cheap, on the half, um, um, do it for less, um, Make the pastor poor, that'll keep him humble. Um, There is a lot in that that is crushing people in ministry and people are taking what you and others are writing and they're using it to beat pastors down. Here it is, bro. That's why you don't get a raise again. Be joyful. 
All right. Meanwhile, they're the board. They're they're not living it, but they're pressing it on pastors and using it against them. And I feel a little defensive of that. I want our families to be blessed. I've said to Mark, I want to bless your family. I want to bless your kids. I want, he, this guy works so hard for the Lord and, and, and I want his kids to know that blessing flows to faithfulness. I, I sent him a little gift and I said, tell your kids it's in thanks for your ministry and because you love God and God's used you in my life, I want our children as pastors to grow up in a place of plenty and abundance and blessing, not in a place of poverty and we're on the short and dad got beat down again and, and, and not having his spiritual in the name of lost people everywhere, which is obviously very important. I'm concerned about that. Are you? Well, I would, I would certainly be concerned of, of, of uh, pulpit committees or, or churches saying we're just going to beat a pastor down. You're not unaware of that. I, I don't, uh, yeah, I guess I am. Uh, of, of, of you are unaware of that. The, the pulpit committees are saying, hey, we're just not going to pay you much because you should oh, be Oh, churches are always doing the thing you led your church through. Hey, cut the budget, make it less, 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 less. Look at our, our, ch- our church, we, we have, you know, our, our weekly budget is uh, you know, almost $500,000 a week at our church. All right but it still doesn't even closely resemble the resources that are available in our church. The last thing I want to do is beat down every budget. I mean, I want to be wise. I want to be careful about how much the worship department's spending, but if we need more overseas, we'll take up another offering. Our church was pounding out all these responsibilities and a million square feet of space and all the things we got going on, but, but at the same time, we take up a love offering. $400,000 comes in for church and helping churches. We started a relief organization, like you're preaching to the choir on that point. People aren't lacking the, the beating down your congreg- your budget in the name of getting more to missions. Why don't you, I'm going to go preach at the Furtick church in two weeks, man. I preached a message at Greg Laurie's church. They call the $6 million message. I just laid it right down on people. This is what God's word says about giving. Let's get it on. Yeah. I'm sure you're doing that, right? Sure. I mean, I, I Pushing the people, people hard to, about giving. To give sacrificially. You don't sure. think they could have given enough to get some crackers to those kids? <laughs> <laughs> no. No, no, I don't, I don't want to do that because I think, I think, here's, here's what, here's here's what, here's what, what you have? think about that. What no, you think about that is, is, I could have given, I'm trying to get a total. Say, yeah, yeah. How many we'll, crackers? I'll pay for your kids crackers. So, I know it, yeah. <laughs> what you were going to say was, what you, I think what you think about it is you think, um, I think that no, yes, they could have given more, but I liked our people going through the process of wrestling with that. It, it was a very sanctifying process and there's ways to love kids besides giving them crackers. Like. Uh, I mean that, and even even my own kids. I mean, because oh, at our church, that's it. It's just yeah. crackers. Well, that's I all know, it is. I know. They walk in, they got <laughs> crackers up to here. They got to eat their way out of the room. Right. That's but, all we do. Nothing else. Nothing else. But the thing You're is, really is, hearing me. No, 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 no. Well, but I am saying like, there's. And there's other ways to show our kids. And I, oh, I'm in the beginning of this game. You guys have yeah. both been parents been for longer ministry? than I have been. I mean, I've been a pastor for five years, been a parent for uh, three or four. And then here's what I'm going to tell you. I'll oh. just say this. Okay. You don't yet understand the toll that ministry takes on your family. And I want you to seriously, prayerfully consider that some of the abundance that would come from writing a best-selling book and all the blessing that's on your ministry, God's obviously has his hand on you in amazing ways. I mean, really, it's humbling to meet a person being used like you're being used. Don't turn off the tap of allowing some of that blessing to flow to your children as a reward for faithful service in ministry. Don't cut your kids off from that. Don't cut your children's ministry off from that. Don't, don't, and don't, don't let them feel that some, or don't, and don't feel guilty for blessing your family with some of the abundance that God's given to you. Okay, I'm gonna let that stand. I'm supposed to do a wrap. Um, and then we'll transition. I thank you both. I love you both. We appreciate you both. Um, here will be my wrap uh, when it comes to finances, wealth, and possessions in the Bible. I tell our people all the time that we can get sucked into the economic discussion or the political discussion, which is rich and poor. And the issue in the Bible is not rich and poor as much as it is righteous and unrighteous. And so there are two kinds of rich and two kinds of poor in the Bible, if you want a taxonomy over it. There are righteous rich who got their money in an honorable way and steward it in an honorable way. There are unrighteous rich, people who obtained their money in a dishonorable way and or stewarded it in a dishonorable way. And the rich young ruler would be an example of that. And then when it comes to poverty, there are those who are both righteous and poor, like the widow who gave her might and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Meaning they don't have money, 
but it's not because they're unrighteous. And the way they steward their money is generous and righteous. There are also those who are unrighteous and poor. The sluggards in Proverbs, the one who chases fantasies, the one who invests foolishly, the one who gambles or drinks it all the way at the casino. And so you've got four kinds, too rich, too poor, too righteous, too unrighteous, righteous rich, unrighteous rich, righteous poor, unrighteous poor. And my fear is, as we have the economic discussion, we overlook the stewardship issue, the generosity issue. And, and my fear is that, and I, and I don't think you're doing this, David, because you are a very careful Bible teacher. That's right. You're a very solid man of the word. But I would just encourage you, I'd implore you to be careful because the younger, less discerning evangelical hearer will hear poor equals righteous. That's it. And it's, it's more complicated than that to be faithful to all of the verses that you and I both love because we love the whole counsel of God's word. So we'll let it stand at, um, at that, take a break, and then I think we've got concluding session. Thanks. Thanks, bro. Yeah, appreciate it.